I'm blessed to be with Dr. Ido Netanyahu, uh, Israeli author, playwright, and physician. And um, there, there are a couple issues that are happening in light of the recent uh, attack on Iran. And I wanted to get in with you to ask you first, what would you like to share regarding Israel at war? It's, uh, I think, too general a question to say. Uh, I'm not sure I can share uh, more than uh, what uh, your viewers know already. Uh, it's a war that we have to win, of course. Uh, it's a multi-front war. I don't think that uh, that uh, we will have uh, any choice but to uh, enter also into Lebanon in order to drive out uh, Hezbollah from our border because right now there are just too many... Uh, dislocated people who are afraid to live close to the border because they're afraid that what Hamas did in the south, Hezbollah will do in the north. Certainly ideologically, they both feel the same way, that uh, the uh, the Jews should be killed, should be slaughtered, and that this is what uh, they deserve. So people understand this, and without uh, Hezbollah taking its uh, militants uh, well away from the border, which they probably won't do voluntarily, we will have to force them to do it. So this is a, a war that will last a while. Uh, we have to, of course, finish the job at the Gaza Strip. That'll take some time as well. We have to move the uh, population that has uh, clustered in the Rafa area, uh, move them up north so we can uh, uh, battle the Hamas terrorists uh, without uh, trying to kill as few civilians as possible. Uh, all this will take time. And then we have the problem, of course, of the Iran, which uh, we don't know. Uh, I mean, Iran is behind the whole thing. But we have a problem of the direct confrontation with Iran, as you all know. And how that will end up, uh, time will tell. Time will tell. But we have to win on all all fronts. So we have there's, the, a, we have there's, the a, real, there's a real pushback to Israel. There's uh, many countries that uh, oppose Israel's right to defend itself. And I think of what you just talked about, Iran, uh, efforts to try to limit a response, or as, as you mentioned, limit a response in Rafa. So what is the general sense from Israeli people about uh, this world criticism of Israel's right to defend itself? It's not, the criticism is one thing. I mean, nobody here takes it seriously as if it's a criticism that's based on the true morality or true values. It's all, the, we know it's all hypocritical. The problem is not the criticism. The problem is what pressure can be brought to bear on Israel in terms of trying to force it to limit its, uh, limit its response. Uh, two things, two main things. One is the supply of arms and needed ammunition. That's one uh, one. Uh, part of the equation. And the other part is, of course, the UN, UN Security Council, the resolutions, will America again abstain from an anti-Israeli uh, resolution or not? Those are the two, uh, I would say, uh, things that are being uh, uh, pushed upon Israel as a, as a leverage in order to, for Israel to change uh, or to limit what Israel might do. Uh, people know this, people understand this, uh, there are some, of course, in Israeli uh, Israeli officials and other people, who uh, politicians who believe that to be reasonable is to uh, accede to whatever America wants. Okay, that to them is a reasonable policy. There are others who say, uh, well, of course, we can't break with America. There's no question about it, but we don't have to agree with everything that America does or wishes which we have not done so far. I mean, there are many instances that we have acted against America's wishes. Nothing happened. We went into the hospital, the Shifa hospital in Gaza, which America asks us not to do. Of course, that was very important because there were, it was a major terrorist center. We did that twice at the beginning and then in the, a few weeks ago, where they were, they were hiding, including high, high militants of Hamas. So, yeah, we, we, we have no choice. I mean, if we want to survive, if we want to live here, we have no choice but to do what is necessary. And if it means that we'll get less arms or less ammunition, or if there'll be a lot of criticism upon us, that's just life. We, we have no choice. People understand. Most, most people understand. I wanted to convey, Dr. Netanyahu, about 
our prayers, uh, many evangelical Christians in prayer for uh, you and your family and all of Israel and safe return for all the hostages. I know it's a very troubling time. It's very upsetting to, to, to know what happened on October 7th. Uh, this has been referred to as a second Holocaust uh, for, for a lot of people, hasn't it? Well, it, it had the signs of a Holocaust. I mean, the Jews have been slaughtered uh, for millennia. Okay, uh, the Holocaust was unique only in its uh, in the huge number of the millions that have died and in the, its expanse, but it was not unique in the, the desire to exterminate the Jewish people. This is not something that was unique. It happened uh, throughout history, certainly in the Middle Ages, whether in Germany and various places. It happened also in Spain uh, to some extent. It happened in Ukraine. It happened in Ukraine during the uh, Russian Civil War, the whites versus the reds versus the Ukrainians. All three armies, when they got to a place where there were Jews, they slaughtered them. The estimates are anywhere between 150,000 and 300,000 Jews were slaughtered around 1920, 100 years ago, by uh, when, when there's no rule, when there's no government that protects the Jews, the population takes the law into its hand and does what it wanted to do all along, and that is slaughter the Jews. And of course, what happened in the Holocaust is that uh, uh, these forces, anti-Semitic forces, rose to the top and were able to gain control of Germany and afterwards all of Europe. And so we're able to liquidate uh, 6 million Jews in Europe. What happened in uh, October 7 is uh, simply another manifestation of this anti-Jewish hatred, anti-Semitism. It's really not, in the, this particular case of Hamas, it's not a matter of national aspirations. It's pure desire and belief that the Jews should be exterminated. And this is part of their uh, the Hamas charter that calls for the killing of Jews. You can see that it's driven by anti-Semitism by the, the way they did it, what they did. If you just want to, whatever, the, the, the way they murdered the civilians, the butchering, the, the rapes, the bashing of the skulls, the burning of babies, the decapitation of babies and others, and the, the way it was done, and the cruelty, uh, and the, 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 the joy, the joy of these people as they were doing it. This is all a sign, a sign of the severe, deep, deep-seated hatred of Jews anywhere, which was also the sign of what happened at the Holocaust. They did it very willingly. The Germans and those who supported, of course, the Germans and the various countries or supported the anti-Semitic agenda of the Germans. So uh, it was a manifestation similar to the Holocaust, but of course it was not the Holocaust because we had uh, have an army, okay, which we did not have in World War II. And we have an army, we have armed people, and we're able to stop this from going any further. And, uh, and now we're fighting back in order to uh, crush the Hamas fighters, uh, terrorists. And uh, I'm sure that with the crushing of Hamas, the population that hates us so much will also sort of uh, calm down. It won't, uh, they'll still keep on hating us because that's what they've been led to, uh, brought to believe for many, many years. That this is the, uh, what they should be doing is killing Jews and hating Jews. So that won't change, but their desire to do so it will lessen because uh, they know the consequences. And just as in Germany, when the Nazis were defeated, people didn't stop hating Jews. Okay, they, they didn't change overnight, but they understood that it's not something they can accomplish, at least for the time being. Uh, I and our evangelical audience are in grief uh, with you all there in Israel, what, what has been happening. And so we'll continue to, to pray for blessings for you there. And, and I know that you have a very uh, wonderful background uh, in, in a medical field. Explain to our, our viewers that. Uh, uh, I've introduced to you as Dr. Ido Netanyahu. So what is your doctorate degree in and what has been your medical experience? Oh, I, uh, that's not something that's it's not important. Uh, I, uh, okay. I went to medical school in Israel and uh, afterwards I trained most of the time in America as a radiologist. I did so because I wanted free time in order to be able to write. And uh, that's it. I've been working as a physician uh, part-time ever since then for many years now, devoting half my time to writing, whether in novels or other books or plays, and the other half of my time to doing medical work. 
in order to pay for the expenses. So this is the, this is the way I lead my life. I have been doing so for many, many years. Well, I was really intrigued by one of your plays entitled Meaning. Uh, so uh, explain to our, our viewers about, you know, oh, Rob, what is the, the basic uh, premise of the, the play called Meaning? I know that there's reference to Dr. Victor Frankl and uh, comments about the Holocaust. Uh, so what is the play? Uh, was is, you, you can summarize the play for our viewers. Sure, I'll, I'll try to do <laughs> a few short sentences. Uh, Viktor Frankl was a, is a true figure. He was a well-known psychiatrist who uh, had a certain uh, way of uh, treating patients in, in terms of trying to, for them to try to find meaning in their life, which is, of course, is very important. There's no question about it. And uh, he, uh, this was his method. And he happened to be uh, in the camps in World War II. He was, a, he was a Jew from Vienna. He was taken to the camps in World War II. And he wrote, uh, quite soon after the war, he wrote a book about uh, his experiences in the camp and tied it together with his, uh, what he called logotherapy, the therapy by which, uh, in a nutshell, he uses uh, the idea that one has to find meaning and this is the cure for uh, many psychological problems. Uh, the play uh, takes place, uh, all the other characters are imaginary, except for Viktor Frankl, and the situations are imaginary. But the play it takes place, goes back and forth between Victor in the Holocaust and the camps in Auschwitz and Victor uh, 17 years later in his uh, clinic in Vienna, where he treats a woman who happens not to be a Jew, uh, but she has a child, a child that she uh, that was born to her and to her lover, Jewish lover, who had died in the Holocaust, who found refuge in her apartment until he finally left it. Uh, he didn't know that she was pregnant. And this child, because he's half Jewish, 17 years after uh, the war, or 15 years after the war, whatever, is being uh, tormented by his uh, peers in school because he's half Jewish. And once again, anti-Semitism rises to the top, and she wants to understand what is the meaning of all this, and who's a better person to explain to her the meaning than Viktor Frankl, who's the expert on meaning. That's, that's the, uh, I would say, the plot of the play. Uh, the basic idea behind it is... Uh, sort of back and forth between this woman who, as she's as she undergoing the therapy, reads his book about the Holocaust. And uh, she takes one side in this conflict between them, and Viktor Frankl takes the other side. And the conflict is between the way Viktor Frankl understands the Holocaust and what happened there. To him, it's purely a matter of uh, human morality, uh, between good people and bad people. The guards were bad. And uh, the uh, the inmates, the camp inmates, were for the most part good. So it's a matter of inner goodness versus inner badness. Not taking into consideration, you actually read the book and it's just, something strikes you as very strange. All of a sudden I realized at the end of the book, well, what's going on here? He doesn't use the word Nazi even once. He doesn't use the word German even once. The whole bit of anti-Semitism doesn't exist there. <laughs> it's as if it's as if it's just a moral struggle between good and bad. Of course, it's a struggle between good and bad. But it doesn't take into any consideration the anti-Semitic ideology as the driving force behind what all that's happened, the Nazi ideology, the anti-Semitic ideology as if it does not exist. And then when I read a little bit about his biography, he also claimed and said that he, as a physician in Vienna, as a Jew in Vienna, all those years, never once encountered any form of anti-Semitism. I and mean, can you imagine? The Vienna, the cradlehood of uh, modern anti-Semitism to a large extent, this is where Hitler learned the power of that, the political power of anti-Semitism when he was in Vienna for many years, and understood the political power of anti-Semitism. Uh, in such a Vienna, Viktor Frankl is a Jew, never encountered anti-Semitism. It's either willful blindness or I can't tell you what. But this is very, fairly typical of Jews who do not want to uh, face up to the problem of uh, anti-Semitism, that it's an unsolvable problem, cannot be cured, and prefer to ignore it and to try to... Uh, 
address this problem or to think the solution lies in uh, creating, let's say, an international world. Communism, why so many Jews were drawn to communism is because they felt that communism, they felt that nationalism is the cause of anti-Semitism. And if you get rid of nationalism, you get rid of anti-Semitism, which is why they were so drawn to communism, which said, no, we're going to do away with nations. It's going to be workers of the world unite, the whole, the entire world. Okay, the workers will unite. Well, we'll be also the workers of the world. So there'll be no hatred against us. Uh, I mean, not there were that those were the Jews who were very active in creating the communist revolution in Russia. Uh, most Jews were not communists, by the way. It's a misconception. Uh, but some of them, the leading ones, were in Russia, and probably without anti-Semitism, uh, the communist revolution uh, would not have happened. Uh, but uh, so this is the typical conflict between Jews who are not. Uh, what what is important in this regard to understand? And she, being a non-Jew understands perfectly well <laughs> that there is this inbred anti-Semitism in the population. Not everyone, of course, but a, a significant segment of the population that's anti-Semitic cannot be cured. And uh, this is something that, of course, uh, Herzl, the founder of modern Zionism, understood. He understood that uh, education and uh, enlightenment and all these things will do no good, uh, that uh, the most enlightened states at that time, or the, the most enlightened state at that time was France. He saw the horrors of the, the demonstrations and the fanatics speaking out against the Jews during the uh, sham trial of Dreyfus in the end of the 19th century, and saw other things, saw what was happening in Vienna, also a very progressive country, uh, and understood that anti-Semitism cannot be cured, and if it will be cured, it'll be too late for the Jews, they'll be slaughtered. He understood the Holocaust will happen. And so he, he said the only solution is for the Jews to leave Europe and create a state of their own. Well, Viktor Frankl was not one of those who was convinced by Herzl's vision, and he felt that uh, Jews could live very well. He returned to Vienna. He returned to Vienna after the war, after the uh, being in the camps, after the Jews were liquidated there, and practiced there as a physician. Uh, to me, it's... Uh, hey, look, the, the play, of course, I don't like these plays that uh, give you only one narrative. The play tries to have him convince the audience as much as possible. Uh, when he argues with her, he gives very good very good reasons, okay? But she counters with her own reasons. I think whoever saw the play did not know exactly what my position was. Uh, certainly the lead actress in one of the uh, countries that where the play was shown in a major theater, uh, who, who was the actress who played the part of the antagonist, was arguing with him. After, after the play, after the premiere came to me, she said she just admires Viktor Frankl very much because she was convinced by his arguments. Uh, but this is the gist of the play, the, the basic. And it's also, it's not only about anti-Semitism. There's a wider range here. Uh, the conflict between those who look upon uh, people who do certain acts, such as 9-11, as acts of uh, desperation because of their upbringing, because of their uh, psychology, uh, this and that, <clears throat> ignoring the ideology. Okay, simply ignoring the ideology, everything is psychological. Uh, ideology drives the world and drives political forces and drives also horrendous political forces, whether it's communism, Nazism, or drives the forces of Islam, radical Islam. It's all ideology. And those who <clears throat> slaughtered the Jews in 9-11, I'm sure some of them, they slaughtered the babies, they cut their heads off. They probably have their own babies in the Gaza Strip and they probably treat them very nicely. Yeah, they're murderers, they're uh, evil, but they're not necessarily uh, psychological uh, psychopaths, unfortunately. If, if they were, it would all be very simple. But people are looking for the simplicity when trying to explain things that they have a difficult time admitting to them the, the difficult conflicts of the world. They try to make them seem uh, uh, very simple, but it's not, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Can it be cured by psychologists? Let's put it that way. It, it cannot be uh, cured by psychology. No. That, that is for sure. But, but, I, but I do know that there are 
uh, so often psychological problems that people that entertain e evil and and, and I uh, thank you for explaining this. Uh, you know seri these serious issues uh, that are, that are addressed in the play. But Victor and Victor Frankel's life is is very interesting, and I I was curious about Victor Frankel and his as you mentioned his reticence to, to address anti-Semitism. Is there some do you, do you think there might be some kind of fear that that he might have had, or um, sometimes uh, Jewish people might have fear to talk about anti-Semitism? No. no, it's not a matter of fear. It's a matter about how they view their life in the, within the Gentile society within the countries where they live. For them to admit that anti-Semitism is part and parcel of uh, the society in which they live uh, makes their life their unlivable. It's a, for them to admit that, it's a, that they will never be accepted as part of mainstream society. They might be accepted today to run this bank, but something will happen tomorrow or something will happen to my child. All of a sudden, the anti-Semitism that is below surface will burst to the top, as we're seeing today. Okay. Uh, wow. I mean, anti-Semitism is often like an iceberg that you see the tip, but the bulk of it is below the surface. You don't see it, and it then arises when certain situations occur, whether it's economic situations or, uh, or other, other problems occur. The Jews, I would say, uh, often refused. It's very difficult to accept this. Okay, if I take, you know, my father was a famous historian in you know, the medieval Jewish history. He wrote a very well-known book about the origins of the Inquisition, uh, the Spanish Inquisition, uh, which was directed not against, by the way, the Jews, but directed against Christians who had been Jews, who were forcibly converted. Uh, with a sham uh, accusation that they were in practicing Judaism in secret. But it was basically uh, directed against those who were of Jewish racial origin. And that's actually in many ways where the racial theory started in Spain in the 15th century. And from there it went to many places, including Germany. But uh, I remember he told me not about the Inquisition, but about uh, the... Uh, you know, some of the Jewish population were not forcibly converted, so there were a few hundred thousand Jews left in Spain living as Jews, openly as Jews. But the hatred towards them was great. And uh, they were evicted in 1492. They were all, having lived there for more than a millennium, they were evicted from Spain by King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella. And you hear uh, the, the documents. He told me there were documents, people that you know, very high, people that he regarded. My father regarded as very intelligent people, who were saying they were writing that the Jews are in a wonderful situation. Just a few years before the the banishment from Spain, everything is fine. We're doing fine. They could not admit that there is this hatred towards them that is so strong that eventually they'll be forced out. Either that is that they gave them the option to convert. Some of them did. Most of them simply left in ships. And it was horrible. I mean, many died on the way by starvation on the boats. And uh, anyway, uh, so that that it's difficult to admit that, that uh, you're not accepted, truly accepted by society. The Jews, certainly modern Jews, have a hard time admitting it. Have a hard time admitting that there is this uh, deep-seated hatred towards them that sometimes waxes and wanes. It's not, not all the time it's so noticeable. They don't want to admit it. Uh, and so they create all sorts of uh, excuses and theories. And, this, and Victor Frankl was a typical case in point of such a person. Very fascinating life, uh, Victor Frankl. And I, I'm just really curious about what Victor Frankl, uh, what Dr. Frank, Victor Frankl might say about October 7th, uh, as I you know, referred earlier about this whole idea about being a second Holocaust, when it really, really wasn't uh, like the Holocaust. Now that Israel has the army, as you pointed out, mm -hmm. you've got a great military, the IDF. So any uh, thoughts about what uh, Dr. I, Dr. Frankel I, might I, respond? In, in he would probably respond the way he responded to everything else. First of all, he didn't believe there was anti-Semitism. So how can you, how can, oh, how can you understand, how can you understand what, uh, what happened on October 7th? Uh, if he doesn't believe that uh, people are driven by this, the ideology of anti-Semitism, which Hamas clearly is and was, uh, anti-Semitism moved in large, in many ways from uh, Europe 
to to the radical Muslim world, to the Arab world. If he doesn't believe in it, he doesn't believe in its power and force. What does he have to say? What would he have had to say about October seven? Again, that these are bad people slaughtering good people. What is the meaning of that? It, it's to me, it's meaningless. It doesn't get it doesn't get you anywhere. It doesn't get you anywhere. It makes you feel good, maybe that you're among the good people, but in terms of uh, addressing the situation and doing something to confront it, uh, it, it goes nowhere. Uh, the, the name of the book of Dr. Victor Frankel, on which your play meaning is based on, is 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 that is that called uh, Man's Search for Meaning? Yes, that's true. That's correct. Okay. The truth is, you know what? The truth is, when I read the book, uh, somebody asked me to write a play about it, and uh, it didn't work out. Finally, I read it. I wrote, wrote about it, and then uh, not with this theater, but other theaters outside of Israel. Uh, but when I read his book. I had a feeling that I'm not getting a proper description of the horrors of the camps. And in order to get the feeling, and I did not read about the camps before. It's something that I had a hard time stomaching. And nor did I go to see Holocaust movies and all these things. So in order to uh, try to gain a, a true understanding of what happened in the camps, I read the, the Italian writers, uh, the Jewish Italian writer, uh, the name slips my mind. Uh, he committed suicide at a later age. Uh, oh, what was his name? Wonderful writer. He was a chemist. Uh, anyway, he wrote, he wrote a book about his experiences in the Holocaust. And that's where I got uh, the feeling. And that's in many of my uh, scenes of the Holocaust are based more on him than on the... Uh, uh, Levy, okay, what's his name? Uh, 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 I wish I could remember as well. Uh, you know what? That's what we have Google for. Let me look it up in a second. Right. <laughs> uh, Wonderful uh, Google. Hey, what do we have it for? Okay, at least it's good for something. Uh, 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 well, I don't, I don't, it doesn't come up, uh, whatever. Anyway, uh, uh, but I used the, uh, I would say, the ideas and insights of Victor Franker and put him in those actual scenes. It's all made up. It's all made up except for the name Victor Franker and his ideology or his ideas or his uh, therapy ideas, which, by the way, I have, I take no, uh, I'm not a therapist and I don't know, I'm not a psychologist, but they sound very reasonable to me, I must say. Mm -hmm. Well, there, there's, a, there's a lot of uh, information about your plays probably on uh, maybe a website. Do you have a website that you would like to, uh, that you have that would talk no, no, about the plays? No, I never, never bothered uh, having a website about my plays. My plays uh, uh, are, have been shown uh, very, not in Israel, it's almost impossible for me with the name Netanyahu being the brother of the prime minister to have a theater uh, dare put on a play of mine. Uh, we have the same cancel culture in Israel as you do in America. Uh, uh -huh. But uh, but so my plays have been shown uh, not so much in Western Europe, not so much because same thing here. Also very strong anti-Israeli bias, uh, but there were many shows besides uh, twice in Off Broadway. They have been shown in the former Eastern Bloc of all places, because those countries that used to be part of the Soviet Union and also uh, the satellite countries uh, were not imbued with the political correctness of the West. And so they're more open to uh, to things that I might be writing. And that's where my plays, they've been translated to, whether it's to Russian or to, uh, to Macedonian or to uh, uh, those languages. And uh, that's where most of the plays have been shown. I, I never try to promote my plays. It's just somebody happens to see uh, uh, a play here, a play there, a director. They come to me and they ask me and if they're good, then I agree to have them show it. I, ne I never try to promote them. I enjoy writing them. And if a play is being produced, that's great. <laughs> I, 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 I just write the, I, I enjoy the actual uh, creation of the play. A play of mine uh, just won, uh, recently won an award in Warsaw, fairly important award. Never been, has not been shown yet. I hope it will be shown. 
But Poland is also going in the way of Western Europe in terms of its political correctness. So I doubt whether it will be shown in Poland. When they gave me the prize, of course, I did not know who wrote it. It was anonymous. I don't think I would have been given the prize had they known, to be honest with you. Uh, there are other other plays that you have written. And, uh, and, and some of those, uh, the top plays, the names of those plays are what? Well, the first play that uh, was shown is called The uh, Happy End. It's a play uh, having to do pre-Holocaust days about uh, the time of Hitler uh, rising to power and a Jewish family in Berlin debating whether to leave Berlin or not. And that's that's the gist of the play. How they view their uh, situation in Germany. And uh, the difficult part here was making people understand that these are not fools. That they're deliberating seriously because people, you know, the audience knows what will happen to them if they stay in Germany. They'll end up in Auschwitz in the gas chambers. Uh, but you have to get the audience into their mindset so that they uh, debate seriously whether to stay or not. Of course, most Jews of Germany did not leave Germany after Hitler came to power. They thought it would pass, you know, pass and uh, nothing will happen to them. They were wrong, of course. Uh, and that was the first play. It was shown in many places, including in America. Uh, and then uh, I wrote uh, another play, this play, Meaning. I wrote another play called The Worlds of Collision. It's about the clash of the uh, uh, wits and wills between a man, happened to be a true man, uh, Dr. Vilikovsky, he was a psychiatrist and a physician. And he had these theories, cosmic theories, and uh, he was brushed off as a, uh, as a charlatan, as a nothing by the uh, Harvard, uh, especially Harvard uh, physicists. Uh, and he had no one that he could discuss his other ideas, except for one person that was Albert Einstein, the most famous physicist in the world, was willing to sit down and talk to him. And they, uh, the, the play is it's called Worlds of Collision. It's according to one of the, the most famous book of Velikovsky. And uh, that play was shown in several places uh, and uh, in a tremendous uh, production by an extremely talented uh, director from Tashkent. He's now in New York. His name is Nabi Abdurrahmanov. Mm -hmm. uh, that's another play, the play, so the play, meaning this play, another play that was uh, shown in Italy. Uh, it's, uh, it's called uh, Myth. Whatever these are more or less, and then this play, the one in Poland, uh, I'm sure it'll be shown eventually, and another play that was uh, a small production in Israel. Uh, and those are those are my plays. I, I I'm, I'm a slow writer; it takes me time to write. I don't I don't write quickly, and uh, I think of every sentence that I do. When you read it, it reads flows. Okay, but it takes me time to uh, to do these things. Well, I can identify with that because I'm a slow writer as well. But uh, yeah, we have we have that in common. And you know, for more people mm -hmm. to to know about this, so that is so uh, crucial. I mean, there's information sometimes on YouTube about uh, different uh, plays. Um, I'm I was wondering if you have one of your plays on YouTube. Uh, yeah, yeah, there is uh, the the Worlds of Collision, the Russian production. Mm -hmm. uh, is on YouTube. It has English subtitles. But to see a play that's, you know, uh, that is being, uh, you know, that use a camera in the theater to uh, to document it, it's not the same as being inside a theater and uh, w watching the play. Uh, anyway, but that for sure is on YouTube. Uh, this play, Happy, Happy End, that was uh, a happy end that was in Off-Broadway. I know it was filmed by a production company. And uh, the, the, there's this uh, channel, uh, internet channel, that shows uh, plays, whether it's still running there or not. Uh, the play itself, uh, I, have, I, I don't know. But those are the two plays that I know were filmed completely and have been shown. One of them, YouTube for free. And the other is uh, in this channel that I guess you have to pay a few dollars to see to see a happy end. Any uh, final comments you'd like to, to share with our uh, Christian audience? I, I know, uh, as I mentioned earlier, that uh, we're in prayer for, for you all there and for uh, 
especially I think about the safe return of all the, your hostages and healing for the hostages. But uh, what would your message to a, a lot of evangelical Christians that are been so supportive of Israel and they they see uh, blessings for those that bless Israel in Genesis twelve three. Well, first of all, I thank them for the support. I think uh, I cannot imagine what we would be uh, uh, in terms of our uh, ability to influence America without the support of the uh, evangelists. And uh, so this is very important to us. Uh, first of all, the, the, uh, the uh, boost that we get uh, morally by, by the Christian support but no less important is the, the political support that we have. And it's very important. Uh, this is supporting Israel is not just supporting Israel. It's supporting what is good in the world. And what is good in the world is not what's happening in the radical Muslim countries. It's not what's happening in Iran. It's not uh, the protesters who are protesting in the streets of America. Now for Iran, before that for uh, Hezbollah, before that one day it's for uh, Hamas, another day, it's because whatever is against Israel, they're supporting for. Okay. What's good in America is uh, those who believe in the West, those who believe in the American principles and uh, shared values. And uh, supporting Israel means supporting America. Now, there are many who say we don't want to support America. There are many in America who hate America, unfortunately. How it got, it's a long story. How it got that way, unfortunately. But it's a long process. Uh, that unfortunately has its consequences. But for those who still believe in America and what it stands for, and uh, that there's such a thing as the free world, uh, they should support Israel because uh, if we don't win this war and if we don't succeed, uh, this will have dire consequences on the America and on the entire West. I'm sure of that, I'm not just saying it uh, in order to sound uh, bombastic, I'm, I'm certain of it as I'm certain that I'm seeing your face right now <laughs> on the uh, on the screen. Mm -hmm. it, it is very uh, a very serious time that we're dealing with. Uh, what's at stake for Israel's security, and so we continue to pray for for you and uh, your family and uh, all of Israel. And I thank you for joining thank me you. today. Uh, these are very three much. important issues, and hopefully seeing you uh, in Israel in the very near okay. future. Sure, very much. Uh, I, hope, I hope we can meet. Very good. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Netanyahu. Bye-bye. I appreciate it.